Hello, I'm Alan McGuire, and this is Juvenalia, a podcast about childish things. Some pedants might point out that it's actually pronounced Juvenalia, but those people are wrong. Juvenalia is the art that we make when we're young and unformed. Juvenalia is the art that makes us when we're young and unformed. Now that sounds pretentious and made up, and it's true, I did just make it up and I'm very pretentious. What it basically means is that every two weeks or so I'll talk to a cool, interesting person about a book or film or TV show or whatever that was important to them as a child and how they feel about it now. So that's the gist of it, let's go listen to a podcast. Hello, I'm Alan McGuire, the human editor of Headstuff.org, and this is Juvenalia, a podcast about childish things. Let's go host today is Ellen Tannum of Her.ie and the Internet. Hello. And our guest is Sarah Griffin, who is a writer and author. She Her book, Spare and Found Parts, is coming out on Green Willow Harper Collins at the end of the year, and she has a food column with the Coven. Hello, Sarah. How's it going on? Hi, Ellen. What are you going to talk to us about today? I'm going to talk to you guys about The Fifth Element, um, a film by Vic Besson, starring Bruce Willis and Mila Jovovich. Cool. So it's a... I watched it this morning again um, for the first time in a year or so, but there was a really long period where I watched it every night before I went to sleep. Um, the score is really beautiful, and the sort of landscape of it, of it is very beautiful, and I had a tiny telly in my room growing up, so I just used to stick in the DVD and let it roll. Uh, it's on, on recent watching, it's a noir. It's about a hard-nosed detective type yeah. guy, yeah. Um, former major in the army, um, now cabbie, uh, who's disillusioned and his wife's just left him and he lives in a tiny apartment with a beautiful white cat and smokes futuristic cigarettes and regularly gets held up or robbed and one day a beautiful bizarre looking woman drops from the sky in a very futuristic New York into the back of his cab speaking a peculiar language and their adventure sets off from there so so when did you first see it so my dad's a big movie buff and uh my god when i say it's around 15 years ago i'm deadly serious he built a home cinema into the side of our gaff so he built it from by hand uh, he built the screen out of wooden uh, out of a wooden frame and cloth and he built the shutters on it to make it bigger or smaller depending on the screen and or the the resolution the aspect yeah. ratio, the yeah. aspect wow. ratio. Yeah. he built a second hand projector he built a computer that would play dvds because they just come out then laser discs and then they just came out and then hd and then blue he bought a ps3 when i was working in gamestop as a blu-ray player um and he started collecting dvds and collecting movies so the first time i saw it was uh in the side room of our house which with a little bit of smoke and mirrors turns into a cinema so yeah i saw it with my dad for the first time and i thought it was just the most fabulous thing I'd ever seen it's a very visually striking film yeah so I mean like it's I remember I came to saw it in the cinema when it came out and it just it felt like the most futuristic thing I'd ever seen yeah like I was like 13 I think yeah and it just and even now still it still seems futuristic which isn't always the case with sci-fi no I mean it hasn't dated in that way no. uh, other aspects of it have dated but the aesthetic is still very out of reach i feel like a bit like the way terry gilliam's brazil kind of feels where this uh, and i think it's because there's not a lot of cgi used in it mm. and the cgi that's used in it is really light it's done with a very light hand and jean paul gautier designed everything the props the costumes he designed the whole thing so the whole thing's aesthetic is very specific yeah. and i think that that is what builds the world and makes that distinct from other sort of futuristic things reminded me of metropolis a little bit yeah mm. yeah yeah, it's like got a very much. really interesting style. There's a lot of weird bodies, and the creatures in it are very kind of unusual. Uh, no kind of no bobble, no grey bobbleheads. Like it's not like aliens no. from the future. It's mm. aliens are really cool. And like, what was the name of the evil one? The, the man- Jean Baptiste Emmanuel Zorg. Zorg. Gary yeah. Oldman. His hair is fucking deadly. He's amazing. I was reading about him this morning, and seemingly he took uh, a lot of. He was playing Zorg as Bugs Bunny. Yeah, and he didn't. He didn't want to. He didn't like the film. No, he was doing his part as a return favor to Luc Besson for funding a film that he had done. It was like a trade out, I believe. So the story yeah. goes. But uh, yeah, his org is really interesting. Like his villain is really interesting because he's uh, he's an arms dealer. His whole uh, he's like a. I'm not going to say the word Trump, but he's a multi. <laughs> like he's a sort of a multi um, million business owner who profits from chaos and misery and because the more trouble people are in the more stuff they need mm-hmm. and uh he 
is uh, he's a wonderful bad guy and also he never meets bruce willis they never cross paths that's really unusual he's causing yeah. bruce willis all this trouble and there's so m- so many capers and chaos and so much uh uh it's a very fast moving plot and there's a lot happening but the bad guy never meets the hero that's like now when bad things happen it's always from like a corporation at a distance yeah. or Faceless. even how battles are fought and stuff now because mm-hmm. like pretty much it's like there's a world war going on now but it's all done with like drones and like dropping stuff from a distance and it's all just kind of like clinical decisions rather than like person on person combat it's really interesting it's a really interesting exercise like sort of example of like control and where the I guess it is kind of a comment on capitalism like everything is a comment uh, everything is a comment <laughs> everything, everything is a comment is, like yeah. you, you know this we know this but there's a wonderful scene in it where he's explaining to the actor's name has just appeared out of my head he plays Bilbo Baggins in Lord of the Rings Ian Holm yeah. he's like he's saying to Ian Holm plays this priest um, called Vito Cornelius who discovers uh, or who is sort of the head of the order of the ch- for the want of a better word church that uh worship these beings that Lilu is is a mm. is a reproduction of or a, a human version of and uh, he's having this conversation with Zorg early on early on in the film and Zorg is like if I just mess things up a little then people are going to need to buy this robot and people are going to need to buy this robot mm. and oh this happens and this person will need this so it's a uh, pretty on the nose like evil evil he's just very greedy there's no oh yeah he's 100% greed and he's, he's, he's like mega like mega uh, the money that tell yeah, the word no. I can't say. Yeah, he's not that clever enough. Words. What's that word? Megalomaniacal. It's hard. That's yeah, two words. Words yeah. are real stressful. Yeah, yeah. that language. It's a megalomaniac. Yeah. It's a kind. Yeah, yeah, he's not. He's not smart enough to be a megalomaniac. He's, yeah. No, he's just a dick. Yeah, he's the worst. <laughs> but he is also in contact with this. The sort of the forces of good and evil are at play throughout the whole film, and that these there's this race of of incredible, uh, like super god alien type things, or when they that open this they they open the film. They're very Gilliam looking, actually. They're very. Uh, they're just these huge copper beings. Their design is gorgeous, and then there's an evil thing that kind of balances out the, the good things. The evil things are kind of like lice, like giant bugs. Uh, yeah, they're. I think I think they're more like a cut. They're they're like an orc race. Yeah, they're evil too. There's yeah. lots. Of, there's lots of evil and lots yeah. of good. But the the thing that makes the oil drip down Zorg's forehead, that is like somewhere in the d- I, the the radio can't hear me gesticulating wildly <laughs> in the distance, but. Uh, yeah, so it is. So it is sort of ultimately very, um, like it's a it's a hero's journey and all that. But uh, the style of it and the aesthetic of it and the tone of it is kind of what I loved more than anything. Um, growing up, and uh, I don't. I don't think I've seen ever seen anything like it since. Why do you think you like rewatch it so much? What were you getting out of it? When I was rewatching it, uh, it was the me. The score is the score is outstanding. Um, and I'm big into film scores I kind of bopping around listening to orchestra music all the time um, and there's a, there's a certain um, chord to it that I just find really really peaceful and uh, there's other things that I kind of watch over the years to help me go. I'm not, not, a, not a mad sleeper um, so I kind of watch stuff in the evening and I would have my other thing that helps me go to sleep is the X-Files which is sort of antithetical <laughs> to sleep because <laughs> it's quite scary but similarly it's got this tone to it and i don't really know how to describe that in very specific terms but the fifth like element how twin peaks has a tone yeah 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 and only when i'm watching twin peaks i have to kind of sit there with my arms around my knees and like just, my eyes wide yeah i got the i got a box set of twin peaks when i was 16 from my dad after a breakup and he was like i'll cheer you up <laughs> and it was the first six episodes and it was before sort of torrenting or downloading and yeah. i had yeah. only had these six episodes of it to watch i'm actually writing a thing for the gloss about that so stay tuned um but the tone of the fifth element, while that's hard to describe, I feel like the I think that um, Bruce Willis's voice has a really interesting cadence to it, and the way the scripting works is very pleasant. There's just something very pleasant about it, and that is what that would be my rain sound effect, you know, or my thunder in the or distance. Whale yeah. songs, or whale songs, yeah. yeah. Um, and once you get so used to something, you're like, oh no, this is like okay. my friend. Uh, used to listen to she used to put 30 rock on dvd and put the volume on really low and it would be the only thing that could get her to sleep because she couldn't sleep when it was quiet which i think is like so weird because i love it when it's really quiet it's the only time i can sleep 
but she would have like Jack and Luke like really low in the background and then she'd just nod out no your buddies yeah no I'd be the same my other ones mm. would be like Red Dwarf or Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy the BBC radio series Um, there's lots of just really lovely it's not ASMR you know like mm-hmm. people massaging your head or like slowly crinkling paper it's just other landscapes that are really pleasant mm. to tune into mm. you said you kind of stopped watching it then for a while yeah did you just like you think you grew out of it or you moved on to something else or life changed I moved out of my parents house and I moved to Galway and I started watching documentaries instead but it always kind of lingered with me um, as something that was really important and like the way I guess I continue to watch things like the X-Files and I continue to revisit it and revisit things like Twin Peaks because they're in the cultural eye and there's something you can talk to other people about there's something that kind of there's a certain knowledge that other people have of these shows and the sort of like a bonding yeah. Yeah, and mm. it's something you can have the chats about, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, where it's kind of saying to someone, oh, did you ever see The Fifth Element? Guess how many times I've seen that movie. <laughs> it's yeah. like, it, that's actually real off-putting for people because people don't know it. Or they're like, really? The one with Chris Tucker? Because that's the one everyone, that, that people yeah. <laughs> people remember him for some yeah. reason. Um, so it's just something that kind of fell out of the loop of my life. But when you asked me to do this, you're like, well, what's one that's really influenced you? I was like, oh my God, The Fifth Element. You know, it yeah. holds it holds this huge space for me, and I don't. And again, it's like so much, like falling in love with anything. It's very hard to nail exactly mm. why, uh, but it's just always been there. Because mm. you know? like your book, that's uh, Spare Me Found Parts, is sci-fi. Mm. It right? is, yeah. It's. And is, can you see the fifth element in it? Or I tr- I you know. I didn't watch the fifth element at all during the writing of Spare Me Found Parts. Um, and funnily enough, the structure, the thing, like I said earlier about the Fifth Element, is that it's very, tr- it's a very sort of traditional um, man on quest. The item that he has to retrieve is the beautiful woman. Yeah. Cough. <laughs> um, <laughs> like there's a lot. It's very patriarchal, even though it's quite. It is a. It is a. It's really subversive in that it's very camp and it's a, quite a queer text in other ways. Um, what I was trying to do with spare and, far, spare and found parts was actively disrupt that and actively refuse to. Um, take part in that kind of storytelling um, because I'm kind of as much as I love Bruce Willis as a sort of a hard-nosed exhausted ex-major I'm kind of I feel like I've known enough heroes like that um, yeah. so Spare and Vampires is about a young woman who in a hundred years from today in Dublin uh, after the destruction of this of society there's give or take as many people in Dublin as there would be at Electric Picnic um, it's about a young woman who builds herself a partner out of a forbidden computer and pieces of uh, other people's bodies and um, biomechanical limbs so it's her meets Frankenstein meets children of men basically and um, the reason one of the things that brought me to it was that I don't feel that there are enough stories in the world about women who make and women who have agency around the things that they create without being mothers and mm-hmm. uh Fifth Element is not a feminist work. There's not a shred of it in it. No. I mean, Mila Jovovich is terrific and the role of Lily was really captivating, but she's effectively, she's a passenger. And she's all powerful and she's perfect, but there's purity politics that happen in there mm-hmm. as well. Like, you, just because she's lovely and nothing terrible happens to her doesn't mean that it's not kind of like icky. When Bruce Willis and Ian Holm are talking about her, like, she's not, they always talk about her like she's not there and can't hear them. Mm. They're like, oh, she's perfect, and she's like, la 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 la. And I'm just, <laughs> like, it's just, I find that really weird because I'd never seen it before, and I was like, it's like she's the main thing, but she's like behind the glass wall. Like. The first woman we see in the film is naked. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. like I've, I'm always, I, I feel like this radar that I can't ever switch off is just that. But how, but how many women are talking? Can Once they, you hmm. see it, you can't unsee it from everything, though. Yeah, ever, yeah. and even with something you love very much. Yeah. Like you wouldn't have been aware of that at the time. No, I just thought yeah. I really wanted to have orange hair and run around. Has that <laughs> been hard to reconcile, like rewatching it with it, your different outlook on the world and like patriarchal yeah. stuff and stuff? Yeah, it, it it has been difficult, but I think that there are, there are things that I see in it now with the sort of a critical gaze that I didn't see the first time, like how incredibly subversive Ruby Rod is. So Ruby Rod is Chris Tucker's character who's a radio host and he kind of leaps around during the latter half of the film uh, causing trouble. And... Uh, He's um, phenomenal and he is hyper camp and hyper sexual and his body is really interesting. His costuming is fascinating and the wigs that they have him in are amazing. And 
he's sort of a bit like Prince in the way that he kind of almost transcends gender because he's extremely feminine. No Prince was meant to be. <sighs> it was supposed to be Prince Mel Gibson <laughs> and Julia Roberts. Mel Gibson was going to be like Bruce Willis and Julia Roberts was going to be Lily. I would watch that. I yeah. would watch that. Re- I would watch that sort of alternate universe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just like slightly flipped. Yeah. Oh my god, yeah. I would. I really would. But that's mad that you said that because I was reading about it today and it was like Prince. He said he pulled out. Like he signed on oh. in ninety two, and it took so long to get made that he pulled out oh. for some other reason. But that's yeah, that's amazing. Well, mm-hmm. he's 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 Prince like in that mm-hmm. sort of uh, sexually ambiguous. But also sexually aggressive, but without impairing unpleasant. Like Frank and Freddy in Rocky Completely Horror. like Frank and yeah. Freddy. And all the scenes, all the sex scenes in it, other than the, the, the final shot of the film, is like, oh, come on, guys, you know what I mean? But the um, all the sex scenes in it, um, this sort of this this uh, sequence where uh, Bruce Willis and Miljavich are leaving planet Earth to go on to this final stage of the quest, like leaving the light world, going into the dark world, going to finally gather the four magical stones, which each represent an element. And yeah. when they're all gathered together with Miljavich, we'll save the world, right? It's like Zelda. Uh, spoilers, <laughs> totally like Zelda. Yeah. I have Zelda tattoos, man. I'm really predictable. Like, get out of town. Ellen, Ellen has just, just showed <laughs> her also her Zelda tattoo. Alright, hang on, hang on. <laughs> Taking my shoes off. This is it. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. I have the ocarina of time on my left foot and the fairy ocarina on my right foot. And no nice. regrets. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so the structure of it is very, very traditional in that way. So when they're leaving the light world and going into the dark world and heading off to the uh, to Flots in Paradise, uh, which is where the rest of the film takes place um, they go on this massive intergalactic spaceship and these beautiful air hostesses I love their costumes um, <laughs> jump, go to you. <laughs> they look like perfume bottles yeah. <laughs> um, and freckles they've all got freckles yeah. and white hair like it's very very interesting and very diverse cast as well and there's a sequence where Ruby Rod is kind of given it loads with an air hostess but like he's given her loads and she's just enjoying it and there's this re- it's super subversive because in what film have you seen recently when there has been like a scene of, oh my God, I can't, I'm barely here 10 minutes and I'm like, <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, no, he's going down there in the, uh, in one of the compartments. And when do you ever see that on cinema? Mm. Ever. That was like, um, or in science fiction. You know, yeah. Blue Valentine. Yes. Everyone was given out about that because um, like there's a way different reaction to men getting like blowjobs compared to like yeah. women getting gone down on. It's like, grosser apparently to people they're like so disappointing like the good wife had a scene like that as well which was huge controversy where like yeah. she's like stood up with her husband and he comes back and she lets him go down on her in the bathroom and it's kind of it's a really hot scene like but it's network television yeah like it's, it's like you never ever see it yeah it, and it's well yeah. you don't you don't actually see the act in the in the fifth element of course it's yeah. always just alluded to as is yeah. a, as is everything but you would imagine in the context of ruby rod is this fabulous hypersexual celebrity and these are these wonderful fawning air hostesses I and mean, realistically in a traditional in in the very traditional world that this film is set well, in everybody thinks you that would mean, think yeah. these air hostesses are like gonna be going party down this yeah. beautiful man yeah but what's actually happening is he's like no 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 you yeah <laughs> and that's wonderful that's yeah. super and i feel like honestly watching it growing up it definitely impacted me being like no hang on actually hang on now this is this is correct you know <laughs> so yeah um so there's something really subversive about that and also in that he's super camp as well yeah. and yeah. his performance of gender is sexually really fluid, kinda. super sexually fluid. Mm. When do you ever see that in science fiction? Mm. I mean, like that in contrast with uh, Bruce Willis is really interesting and there's a lot of backlash around the time uh, and culturally still kind of is a lot of backra- black- bleh, backlash around uh, Chris Tucker's role and that was like, oh, he's so annoying. I'm like, mm, no, campness is, is disrupts what, yeah, due to different gender a lot of and hetero people find stuff like that hard to deal with when it's a narrative that they're used to seeing play out in a certain way. Yeah, like, mm, definitely. Yeah. No. And <laughs> and Bruce Willis absolutely can't stand him. Yeah, yeah. And that's really interesting mm. to me as well because he's Willis wearing a really tight orange vest. Oh, did I say that like he's kind of hot, man? I'm sorry. Oh no, he <laughs> is. No, he is kind of hot. Like absolutely not. No, he's just like John he's still got McClane. Lots of hair. Yes, he's basically like. Right off the back of John McClane into outer space. Yeah, he's like, he just woke up and he's like, oh, shit. <laughs> oh, here we go again. Here's my cigarette and I'm talking to my mom on the phone, you know, like p- putting a photograph of his ex-wife down on the dresser, you know, yeah. like it's, it's, and that's where it meets noir. 
Yeah. And that's such uh, a cool observation. I never thought of it that way. My wonderful husband, Kerry Siebel's at Siebel's on Twitter. <laughs> very he good. said that to me this morning when we were watching. And he was like, you know, it's kind of like a noir. And I was like, it's exactly like a noir. Um, so uh, I have no idea where we started. Uh, but yes, it's like a noir. It's <laughs> weird that it's kind of, like you said, it's kind of forgotten. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. It was huge at the time. Yeah, it was really it got so much hype. And, and the like, budget was huge. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the like 70 million or something. And for the for the time, that's a lot. Yeah. It was the most expensive film ever made outside America. I did a lot of... I am being so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> gentle. Yeah. Gentle being around. <laughs> and Bassan operated the camera a lot of the time himself. Which is amazing. Yeah. I mean, like, I loved uh, Leon as well. And I think for... And th- that's a noir. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm. Like... I think there's elements of that within there too and uh, I don't think it's a, it's a very, it's a very un-American film and the way that it treats its American protagonist is very uh, there's, there's, there's some othering there happening yeah as well, it's I cool yeah. I wonder why um, like I wonder what drew Bruce Willis to sign on to it like what did he like about it because it just yeah. seemed like outside of his comfort zone completely compared to what he'd done before the couple of years beforehand he mm. was kind of in the wilderness then yeah and it was I guess it was after Pulp Fiction Oh my god! But yeah, that's what it was. Before before about Pulp Fiction, like he hadn't, he'd been in like kids films and like he's weird Disney sex thrillers. Disney sex thrillers. <laughs> Disney sex Tell thrill- me more, Alan. It's my new brand. Thriller. It's my new brand. Yeah, it was called like <laughs> Color of Night or something. I can't remember, but it was like <laughs> gently like types articles into yeah. notes for <laughs> like later. Articles reference. in like the Daily Mirror about Bruce Willis's controversial new film and stuff. I remember because I used to read oh. the Daily Mirror because my parents bought it like when I was like eight or nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but like. It was a huge deal, and he hadn't been an action star really. What for was it called years, again? I think it was called Color of Night. Color I think. of Night. <laughs> but yeah, but he hadn't been a star, like an action star, yeah. for a while. Then. Well, it's innate in him, I suppose, isn't it? Like a, yeah. a lot of how he holds himself, and I actually, I kind of really mad into Die Hard. I'm not one of these like Die Hard Christmas jumper people. It's not really kind of my my bag. But I think that there's, I think observing him in isolation in that film, which I largely did. I yeah. go like I know I have him in the other things as a reference point, mm-hmm. but I. I don't like love him in other things. I'm not like into other, the other film, his, yeah. his his other work. You know, yeah. mm-hmm. this is just one weird film that he happened to show up in for yeah. me. Yeah, mm. and I have a lot of affection for him in that context. His physicality is good. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. The way he moves himself, he's like a like a tank. Yeah, he's very he's all shoulders yeah. and sort of his neck is real broad. He's a bit hot, like yeah, yeah. No, yeah. you would <laughs> absolutely would. Like the more you think about it as well, because again, he's still got like blonde hair. Yeah, and, like, like and like, and he scruffy. isn't like as craggy as he is now. Yeah, he's not an old man. He's yeah. kind of a yeah. young man. Yeah. And uh, hot dad, hot dad, mm, yeah, a little. <laughs> but like he's like a hot, like he's like a mid thirties hot dad. He's like, yeah. I used to work in a bookshop, and every so often, dads would come in like with small toddlers, and like, like the, the other women in the store would like all gather together in a terrible weekend. Guy goes, "That's the dad in the store." I used to work <laughs> in an ice cream shop on oh, Lake Street and mercy. like hot dad central. <sighs> so tiny children, oh Bruce Willis in like a sprog, puttering around like, but um, yeah. So he's and he's interesting in that binary as well because he's not. I guess he is tr- like of, in terms of like the hero, the the like the sexy hero, hard nosed detective, because of his costuming, as well. Like yeah. he wears a luminous, like luminous orange is the sort of the tone of the film between yeah. Lita's hair and her her costume includes it, and his his shirt is is luminous orange. He's not exactly wandering around in a trench coat and a fedora. Like he's yeah, yeah. like he's a taxi driver. You said that orange is like the color of the film and like Lita's hair and stuff, and you have red hair. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think that there is some sort of correlation there at all? Oh, goals. Yeah. Oh, absolute <laughs> goals. Goals forever. Uh, yeah, no, this is not an accident. Um, this is sort of Scully meets Lilu for the rest of my life. I'm very predictable. Um, <laughs> I feel like I'm just like, yeah, these the women who I watched in, in cinema and television growing up, um, I absolutely chose bits of their looks to kind of plaster onto myself as I got older. And it's sort of like it's aspirational aspirational yeah. ginger like i'm so far from being <laughs> like i have i have like i have dishwater hair um but i guess between scully and between lilu uh more lilu in college i was much brighter in college and now i'm kind of transitioning into a into a uh into a scully as i get older but um yeah no definitely like that aesthetic is on yeah. the nose Mila's hair like even i feel like that micro fringe is like a thing 
now a lot like it's kind mm-hmm. of had like a grimes resurgence. kind of yeah. yeah oh she's super grimes man yeah, yeah. she's yeah. <laughs> just kind of like ratty looking but in a nice way like <laughs> but you know they destroyed her hair uh, during yeah yeah they bleached it uh, from its natural color uh, there was no olaplex in those days guys no. tell you that much um so oil was still just in the little fruit thing yeah it was away <laughs> away from <laughs> us Far from argon oil, we were raised. But <laughs> um, baby for me. Oh my for Christ! Years. Oh, tell me about it. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, she they they burnt her hair. They burnt her hair off, so it's a wig for half them. Oh, yeah. I wonder is there a point where you can tell that it's a wig? There actually is because I did read that fact <laughs> early this morning. Her first scenes when she's in the bandages and on the side of the building. Um, the really the really iconic scene is where she jumps off the edge. She jumps off the side of the government buildings and into oncoming traffic and lands in Corbin Dallas's Bruce Willis's car, but there's this great sequence of her walking along the side of the building mm. and she's just because r- she is re- she's not sexualized she's she's objectified in a way and they yeah. the scientists who kind of bring her out of this relic and conjure her forth from a, a piece of steel uh immediately objectify her as soon yeah. as they've created her mm. which is super complicated and mm. something i do kind of try and answer in a in the, the novel that i was working on about can you make something in order to desire it and like yeah. where like where there's something grey there that mm. I'm not really sure about and I think it could be explored more especially when it's men creating a woman mm. like in my case it's a woman creating a man but uh, they were surprised that it was a she like oh of course they were <laughs> they were like I default to male. I'm sorry, yeah. you know, <laughs> like, like and that's the the main one. Surely, but immediately there's this disgusting gag where like the army general's like, I'm just gonna have to take a few photos for the archives, and it's like, yeah, get literally get away from me, and that wouldn't have jarred with me growing up. Yeah, but now I'm like, Ugh, I can't even look at you. Probably because when you were like, what age were you when you thought you probably weren't aware of like sexual politics as a concept? Oh my at god, all. not at all. You know? there was no Tumblr when I was 15, man. You know, <laughs> it was a different world. Like we were. We were learning my face or die, you know. Not even, dude. This is pre then, man. Like forums. I was a moderator of a Pokemon forum from when I was like twelve onwards. I was moderator of a Waterford metal forum. That is amazing. Yeah. Did you have long hair? Yes. Oh my god. I had long hair in transition year, but it just grew Uh, perfectly straight and then got a little kink at the end. Ah, nice. (laughs) And And Jesus. And just blessed with straight, very, very straight hair and long eyelashes and fast growing nails that grow. I've Your keratin is just I know, stunning. Yeah. Stunning <laughs> keratin <laughs> levels. <laughs> it's a great gene pool. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent I love to gene have pool. straight hair. Like if I wanted, mine's just all fluffy. This is not to do with the film. Sorry. The hair, but the hair battle's real. I mean, I'm, sh- yeah. I'm sure Lilu was just like, God, my my strange orange dreads. What? Are you <laughs> <laughs> it's integrated into yeah. sections like that. And Bruce Willis was awake as well. Does he? Was he bald? By <gasps> he would have been bald by then, I think. Yeah. That's so oh upsetting. Man. He was bald in Pulp Fiction. So. Oh man. Mm. Yeah. And the, the illusion is broken. Yeah. <laughs> you don't see you're like, I hate this film. You, yeah. you, haven't, you, you have seen Die Hard, but you don't really rate it. I, I love Die recall Hard. having seen Die Hard at some point yeah. in my life. It's a very Because they film. are, it's almost like he's kind of trying to recapture Die Hard. Because mm-hmm. mm. it is like, even if he's wearing a vest again. There's mirroring, know? for yeah. sure. Ooh. And it's like, working class guy thrown into a much bigger thing against the capitalists. Because mm-hmm. Alan Rickman is just about money in Die Hard as well. Mm-hmm. So Alan Rickman is very old And very little crossover between the villain and the hero as well there. Mm. yeah because Gruber is like he's off in an office yes yeah, oh my the god the whole thing wow maybe they are I'm, maybe I should go back and watch them and kind of Die Hard is actually it's a great film it's so mm. so good like it, it is kind of tainted bit by all the people going oh best Christmas film ever but yeah, it's, like, no, see, it's, just, I get it's a really good film but I that's just yeah. it, it, that's just people ruining things and that just <laughs> happens I just get real I get real spiteful around things like that I'm like oh do you think this is co- no, I you want to be a contrarian I'm the same I'm like yeah. oh does everyone think this I'm gonna not yeah. <laughs> I'm just like oh, I'm gonna go over here and watch another ex- episode of the X-Files again it's like, like when people I ask you if you've watched you know when you're at a party and like lads are like have you watched Breaking Bad you're like no and they're like what do you watch and I'm like I'm re-watching Gilmore Girls and they're like ooh they get so angry but Breaking Bad is literally the greatest piece of television Best ever television and like ever. I, I can't I just 100% have no capacity for it because people won't entertain your reasons for finding it boring. I have tried to watch several of those sort of. I've watched a good deal of True Iconic Detective. TV. Uh, but to True Detective has, all the women in True Detective are either uh, sex workers, teenage sex workers or wives. Yeah. And yeah. you can't unsee it. I'm like, well, this they're not speaking to me. I don't care. Oh, is it about masculinity? That's Get, really so sad. is everything else. Yeah. yeah. And what I will say for The Fifth Element is that it's, it is about masculinity in some ways, but it's actually just so fast paced that it's an adventure story. Yeah. You know, mm. whereas long, reflective, drawn out conversations about the nature of the masculine experience of the universe yeah. is just something wh- when I when I start hearing it, it's like, you know, when you just turn out. 
static. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of. Well, like, th- I think the fifth element, even though it's about similar things, because the world that it's set in is so far removed th- from the real world, you don't think about it in that way as much so you can enjoy it. Yeah. It's a romp. It's yeah. a romp. It's super camp. For me, I kind of would liken it to the early sort of Batman years. Um, I was talking to my husband yeah. about Adam this morning. Adam Batman? Uh, no, 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 no. We're talking sort oh. of Tim Burton era, which is my favourite Batman. Mm. And I can't watch any recent era Batman at all. And, and in you're fact, not into Nolan Batman? It makes me so specifically angry that I probably shouldn't start talking about it <laughs> no, because please, please. I just yeah, can't uh, I get in I have regularly gotten in trouble with the, about, about this because I just think it's this is a safe space to not like Nolan Batman with a Z it's just yeah. trash like it's yeah. just like a dude looking in the, in the mirror sucking his own dick like I don't care yeah. like I don't care I want hopping around rooftops with capes and I want to escape for five minutes from the grueling grittiness of reality I don't want to be like yeah. that's why I don't yeah. want to watch Breaking Bad I'm like I'm going to watch Parks again <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm off yeah, and see us. that's fine and great art does need to be challenging but I think there is a sort of a, a trend in tone the at the moment same challenge all the time and we're having the yeah. same conversation again and again and I would much rather Arnold Schwarzenegger as Mr. Freeze saying stupid things than I would Ice Christian pond. Bale standing <laughs> on a pole in the middle of the the different parts of the in the distance thinking about how hard his life is time being is a, a millionaire yeah. like yeah. time is a fair play <laughs> you know like like thanks, dude. Yeah. You know, c- I would. I think. Are all those prostitutes still dead? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> cool. I'll just watch you as a male stripper instead. Thanks very. All right. All right. All right. That's all. I'm like time is a flat circle. <laughs> Let's go, boys. Like, I I just feel very jaded at this point, and I do think that there are amazing stories out there to watch, and there's incredible art out there to consume and to experience and to become emotionally richer by. But whenever I come up against a dead end, like. True Detective or uh, Batman or anything like that like it just it just disheartens me as a person who makes art, art and as a person who loves art and I love film I stopped watching films for years I've only started my one of my 2016 resolutions was to watch more films mm. because I had lost my ability to enjoy them because I'm sitting down and the checklist starts and then I the checklist leads up to the conclusion that oh this this wasn't made for me okay yeah like I choose my films a lot more carefully now than I would have before especially during college like I had a really good lecturer that would like <coughs> show us a lot of films with like queer subtract and stuff and that was something that I'd never experienced so I never got to relate to stuff like that I had to like make my own stuff mm-hmm. in like normal heterosexual media whereas being shown this stuff that was sort of like this is an intentional subtext which like I, I always think that was, that's really cool like stuff like melodrama films from like the 50s where mm. it's like there's some really gay stuff happening, but they don't talk about it at all. It's but really it's there. It's there for you, and it's there to, to someone being like, "Is yeah, back. it's okay." Yeah, yeah, it's like this is you too. Yeah, and that mm-hmm. means. I mean, and I and I grew up in the and like I'm a Nintendo kid. I played a lot of video games growing up, mm-hmm. and I love science fiction and love science fiction. But now that I'm in the bizarre pos- and wonderful position where I get to make that stuff, I'm just like, no, but I'm not going to put it under the covers. Like, mm-hmm. I'm not going to put this low. This is very on this mm. i'm not gonna have anyone scrambling for subtext or hoping that maybe yeah. these two girls feel this way about each but other. that's really cool because that's only something i think is that's happening in the last while because it like especially when i was younger it just wasn't there at no, all. progress mm-hmm. you know slowly slowly mm-hmm. we'll get there but uh the fifth element when i was the one thing i did think that i was watch when i was watching it, i was like man if i re what what would make this truly great is if corbin dallas ruby rods uh, Vito Cornelius were women yeah. and Lulu was a dude oh my god who I would you cast would oh man that's a really good question yeah. who would you cast um Lulu okay Corbin I would say like Adam Driver for Lulu <laughs> oh my god Adam Driver <laughs> um, Tilda Swinton for Zork oh my oh. god yeah I just want now. I just want yeah. Tilda Swinton <laughs> Jean-Baptiste Emmanuel Zork kind of uh, Tilda and Swinton then, phenomenal yeah I don't know. Who would I have for Corbin? It's a really tough one because you like. You want the same don't kind get of those kind of roles. So you can't. I kind of want like you can't imprint anybody no. onto it. No, but, but maybe yeah. maybe somebody like Nicole Kidman. Oh my god! Or Kate Blanchett, I was thinking. Because she's very oh, good Blanchett. and glacial and icy and stuff. Yeah. yeah, she'd be good. I think Emily Blunt could be good, or Kate Blanchett. I just love, I'll watch. Blanche gets cast in so many super masculine roles, though. I mean, I look, Carol, That's I saw true. her this year, and she was wonderful as this old, like she was beautiful. But I think her 
her arena is sort of a gender queer in itself, you yeah. know. Mm-hmm. That's true. Because um, she's by Dylan too, right? Yeah. yeah you know. That's true, yeah. So I want hyper feminine. You know. <gasps> okay. Like I want the so girls' ponytails. Like okay. So so like Matus. Like yeah, yeah, Matus. Absolutely. Yeah. One hundred percent. Hollywood Honzos. That's it. Like. I'm um, trying to think who would be good. Imagine if you got like fucking like Jennifer Lopez to play Corbin or something. Like some really super That would glam. be incredible. Yeah. Someone hyper glam. Yeah. Um, or like Kerry Washington. Kerry Washington. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Bam. Kerry Washington yeah. for Corbin Dallas. <laughs> uh, Adam Driver for Lilo because I'm just going to continue to objectify him. Um, oh, he's, he's weirdly hot. I can't. I so confusing. Like, yeah. I don't know what I feel. <laughs> Maybe I'll never know what I feel. <laughs> I don't Is know. it because of his character in Girls? No, nope, no, he's a monster in Girls. Can't watch Girls. <laughs> no. I watched one episode of Girls and was like, oh, is that my bone that I can see? Oh, look, look at my... Oh, all my nerve endings. No, I'll never watch yeah, this again. Yeah, I didn't like it. Can't do it. Like Lena Dunham lying on the floor of her parents' apartment going, I'm the voice of my generation. I just turned the TV off. I was yeah. like, nope. It, nope. I don't like it. I, it annoyed me when people I liked related to it because I was like, who are you? <laughs> I mean, no one on that show is nice. The problem with girls is the same as the problem with women. There's only one of it. There yes. should be more. Yeah. Mm. That's the main problem. Broad City is a better representation of gal palship, I think. <gasps> yeah. Praise, praise be, Broad City. Yeah. It's wonderful. I, mm. I, um, I don't think I've been on record in years. I don't think I've laughed authentically at anything in years no. as I have at that, no. at Abby and Alana. But uh, I'm trying to think who I would cast for Rizzy Vaz. Um, who's like Laverne Cox? Um, Lupita Nyong'o. Mm, Lupita? Oh. Yeah. Lupita in comedy, huh? Ooh. Yeah. That would be amazing. She would cut loose. Yeah, maybe yeah. she'd be happy to be given the chance to yeah. do that, you know? Who knows? Um, who else would we have? Who would be Vito Canary's older and fabulous? Um, Judy Dench. That's, well, she's in the default. She's for older fabulous. Dench, what about yeah. Mirren? Mirren. Mirren. They... The age thing, the age thing, is such a problem as well because yeah. there's yeah. only the, the there's so few actors of a certain age. There's like mm. ten that are like older female yeah. actresses, and yeah. they keep putting them all in the same movies yeah. together. They're like, mm. "Here's Marigold Hotel. Oh, <laughs> look at all <laughs> these old people. <laughs> like, it's so rude. Like, yeah. can you just put them in real parts? Like, um, but you know, I would like to see a uh, switched out version of it. Mm-hmm. I would like to see more switched out science fiction. I would like science fiction to be about women, but it's not. Um, and I think that that being where my mind will, but maybe my mind has always gone there with it yeah were you obviously then the new Star Wars like you must have been like buzzing about because it was oh yeah I couldn't stop crying yeah like See, because I'd never seen any Star Wars because I was always just like anyone who talked I'm really contrarian sometimes where like if someone talks about something enough to me that they want me to watch it I won't watch it <laughs> like yeah. I'm like no like I like and then I watched this Star Wars and like the representation of the film in my head was nothing like I saw. Like they're actually just fun movies. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think it was because people who talked to me about them were so serious and they made it seem so boring and clinical when it was actually just like the never ending story or something. Yeah. You know, that kind of It's way. a fantasy. Yeah. yeah. And that's why I think Ray helped me kind of break into that because it was like from her point of view as opposed to if it was from like Luke. just Finns or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I know Star Wars is wonderful, and uh, you wrote a great essay about. Yeah. Oh, Ray. my girls explain Star Wars to you. Mm. Yeah. Uh, that was a time. That was the <laughs> note city. Oh my god, <laughs> those notes, man! I got a. It was shared like ninety thousand times on Facebook, and it just went. It just went. It went somewhere that I don't think I've ever been on the internet before. To be honest, it was cool. It was nice to be able to have a conversation with more women about uh, science fiction. To be honest, and I feel that I for a really long time have wanted to write about science fiction but I got deterred by the climate online around women having conversations around video games mm. um, Anita Sarkeesian and all that stuff yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, I was living in San Francisco during that time as oh, well oh wow uh, okay so uh, a lot of uh, I got to know a couple of the lads who run GamerX which is the queer video game convention Ooh, and wow. um, I kind of would, would glance off that world socially every so often but the climate is horrific and it's not as bad now I, she says biting her tongue but like yeah i didn't get anybody telling me they wanted to kill me after writing that star wars essay so yeah. surely that means i might be able to write one about like zelda i don't know and i would love to write more about science fiction but i've been deterred by uh just how just the climate i and remember when i was little i before i played any zelda games i thought it, that she was going to be the protagonist and i remember being really upset because i was like oh it's late so she doesn't Zelda doesn't do anything. I read Zelda as, uh, uh, not Zelda. <laughs> Zelda. I read Link as female the whole way. Wow. I always put my name in instead of Link. 
Really? Yeah. So I've been reading Link is Female my whole life. And uh, will continue to, uh, no matter what they do. And because uh, you're there with Link's back, it's you. Yeah. Like, it's a story about you. Yeah. And the things that you go through. Like, all like all, all the best works of fiction are, are uh, crawl out of the page and kind of become a part of who we are as mm. readers um, or consumers. I mean, mm. I, I play more video games than I read books. Um, and um, with Zelda, uh, The Legend of Zelda specifically, uh, The Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask, uh, because I'm of the right age to have experienced them when I was most open to those things. Um, I felt that I experienced those games in the second person. It was me that it all happened to. And the work, a lot of the work that I produce is in the second person. A lot of my fiction is you walk into a room and you do this. Because mm-hmm. I think that reaching out of the medium and into the person who's experiencing it. Pull them in. Like, like, pull, like no, pull, like pull them in. Yeah. Like, actively do it. Because, yeah. like, break the novel, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, because video games actively rupture reality in that way and uh it's more immediate that's cool yeah and i know i read i read link as me could be could be so much hair under that hat that's de- yeah oh my god it just could be a, like a top the top. tunic is the tunic is ambiguous it's got earrings you know yeah. yeah when you're a kid and you're looking to be somewhere and be someone you'll find it yeah mm. they can try and stop you and it's guess it's our responsibility as makers of things to make it easier for them to yeah. find it and give them more opportunity and less resistance mm-hmm. to find bits of a mirror in the work, you know? Um, I actually wanted to say Ocarina of Time for this podcast because um, that's my, I guess Majora's Mask is my, that's such a, that's such a dirty hipster thing to say, well, actually, I prefer Majora's <laughs> Mask. I actually prefer the grittier one. But um, that was, of, of and I feel like you, you compared Fifth Element structurally to Zelda. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a fetch quest. Yeah. Go find these things. Yeah. Mm. All right, I will. Like water, fire, earth, and wind. Come yeah. on. Where you heard that before? Because Zelda's so elemental. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, no, it's, uh, it all kind of loops. Th- we've, we tell each other the same stories over and over again, and the structure of these stories overlap onto one another. And, like, they say there's only seven stories, but there's really only one. And uh, ultimately, if you want to boil that down to Bruce Willis carrying Miljovovich bridal style through a giant hotel and returning her to the temple where she belongs with the rest of the special rocks smooching her and showing her the true meaning of love so she can ultimately like charge the universe with her magical power like a lot of emotional labor for her as a woman like fair you know girl like (laughs) fine if that's the one myth fine but I think uh, instead of making me want to be Mila dyeing my hair red or not Mm. Uh, I feel like I still would much rather be Ruby or Corbin. Yeah. And I think people who watch, even though it is uh, dated in that way, I think there's enough weirdness in it as a text to find the weird viewers yeah. and to find the people who are looking for the stuff and bring them in. Mm-hmm. You know? That's all I got. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Prone to getting real serious about good. things. Real, it's like, yeah, turn a left turn. Ah, we're going to serious town. Let's go. Population you. Um, before we started recording, you said you don't think it would be made now. No. Why do you think that? Um, not in the same way. Uh, I think the aesthetic of it belongs in its time. And I think the look of a lot of... Uh, well, I don't think it would be made now because I'd rather make Spider-Man Loves Batman with the cameo from Miss Marvel. They, you know, they wouldn't... Yeah. They, don't, they don't want this kind of work anymore no. because they have their training. They... Hollywood... The system, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that cinema is moving away from, like, like in AAA video games, blockbuster movies, yeah, aren't are just feeding down the same kind of thing at the moment. I think incredible films are 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 still yeah. being made, and I think that that I mean, like I said, I stopped watching films for years, and I'm just coming back into that now. But I genuinely don't feel something as weird as The Fifth Element could exist again. Mm-hmm. The same way I'm not sure if they'll ever remake Brazil, you know. And yeah. if it did, it wouldn't look right because it'd be CGI'd out the wazoo. It'd be mm-hmm. all presumed. Yeah. It'd be all performed on a green screen. There'd yeah. be no props. It'd be textured and layered and filtered. Mm-hmm. The equivalent of auto tuning Ariana Grande's incredible voice into a series of like into effectively a beautiful chip tune. Mm-hmm. Like, it would get touched to a point where you can't see what it is anymore. Yeah. And I think what's what I love aesthetically about 
the um, and I love like the mood and the tone. I know tone is such a weird word, and it's one I keep coming back to because I think that's what I leave pieces of art with is a feeling and a sensation, and rather than detail and like I'm all, I'm all about texture, man. Mm. All about all about touch and things. The vibe. Yeah, all about the vibes. Yeah. California, three years. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you never really come back. No. Um, but it's costuming and there's makeup and there's prosthetics and there's sets huge sets and there is absolutely some cgi but it's all attuned so neatly that the world holds together mm. and like to be fair star wars of course uh, the force awakens is world held together yeah but i don't think that they would throw a budget like star wars the force awakens at something like the fifth element that's something no. as super weird as the no, fifth no. element even though in many ways it is a very traditional story mm-hmm. it's a weird movie yeah and i don't i just don't think it would happen you certainly wouldn't have a scene like chris tucker going down on a beautiful sexy air hostess no. uh you would i prolonged like you you they return to that like you, mm-hmm. you just wouldn't see it and if you did see it there'd be eighty thousand pink pieces dis- dissecting it and discussing it yeah. and taking all of the organic joy yeah. So uh, I think if it were to exist again, we would be in a very different ballpark, um, and it just wouldn't contain the real artistic touches that it did because of the time that it was made in. Like it's, uh, it's, it's of its time, and and in some ways that's its failing, and in other ways that's what makes it like super weird and super great. Hmm. You know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much Sarah Griffin thanks for talking to me Alan and Ellen <laughs> <laughs> so that was the podcast um, this has been Juvenalia it's part of the Headstuff Podcast Network uh, if you want to get in contact with us it's juvenalia at headstuff.org and please subscribe to us on iTunes or Stitcher or similar things and rate us nicely thank you very much and we'll see you soon goodbye bye 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 This has been a production of the Headstuff Podcast Network.